Returning this morning to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, and Paul's words in verse 24. And our subject this morning is Paul's excellent ministry. Acts 20, verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now we know from a number of verses in the New Testament that Paul is a divinely appointed blueprint, a prototype for every true Christian and especially for soul winners. The apostle himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 said, be ye followers of me. And some of you will know that the word translated follower there, it means an imitator. It's the Greek word mimic. We are to closely note the example of the apostle and follow him. Philippians 3 verse 17, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an ensample. And the word ensample, it means a model, a pattern, a type, something that is set before us to imitate. Every one of us who professes to be a true Christian, are called to imitate the Apostle Paul. He is our blueprint, not, of course, in his apostolic gifts, but in his walk and in his approach to the gospel. And they are my two main headings this morning. We're going to think firstly of Paul's excellent manner of life. And then secondly, we are going to think of Paul's excellent ministry, particularly the gospel that he preached. So to begin with, I want us to think of seven characteristics of Paul's manner of life that we see in these verses here in Acts chapter 20 particularly. His behavior, his attitude to life, his approach, his walk. He is a perfect example for us of how we should approach life as Christian people. He was undeterred, we have it here in this verse, undeterred in his devotion to the cause. Many witnessed to him, Paul, as you go up to Jerusalem, trouble awaits you. There will be bonds, imprisonment, arrest, and worse. These things didn't move the Apostle Paul. He was undeterred. He was resolute. These are not my seven headings, by the way. I'm just painting the picture here. He was resolute in his determination, he says, to finish the course. This is taken from the athletics world. The race that is to be run. Our course may be different to the apostles. He had his assignments. He had that path through life of Christian service that was unique to him as a missionary apostle. But his mindset was that he would remain unmoved, determined to finish the assignment, the course that was set for him by his heavenly master. And we need to imitate the apostle in these things. So in more detail, here are seven character traits of the life, the manner of life of the apostle Paul. And the first is that he, is, he lived a consistent life. What you saw was what you got with the apostle. Just go back to verse 18. He says to these Ephesian elders, you know from the first day 
that I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. There was no change. I remember in conversation with someone once, a, a, a brother was talking to me about an elderly minister. And he said the remarkable thing about his ministry is that over the years, if you go back, you listen to his sermons, you learn his approach to worship, to church life, the standards that he upheld, there's been no change. Almost all the way through his life as a minister of the gospel, he stood for the same things, he's approached life in the same way. And that could be said here of the Apostle Paul. From the first day, at all seasons, Paul was a consistent man. He didn't change with the wind. At all times, he was, you could say in general terms, serious, gracious, joyful, heavenly minded. Everyone knew Paul. You could read him because he was so consistent. Could that be said of us, Christian brothers and sisters, that people know what they will get if we visit them, if they worship with us, if they observe our life, we're always the same. It, it doesn't mean that our circumstances are the same. Paul's were dramatically different from week to week. One week he was being lauded as an apostle. The next he was imprisoned as a criminal. But Paul, in his manner, in his behavior, was so consistent. At busy times, when he was in great demand, Paul remained joyful and, pers and personable. Are we like that? Or when we suddenly become busy... Do our Christian graces begin to wane? Uh, do we allow the old sinful character traits to come to the fore? Because we're busy, we're stressed, we become impatient. Paul didn't. From the first day, at all times, he was a consistent individual. He was not a self-seeking person. Always had time. For others, when he was weary, he was Paul. When he was disappointed and plagued with trouble, we see here that he speaks of, in verse 19, of many tears and temptations. We'll come to that in a moment. But in those times of emotional trauma and grief and, and, and uncertainty, Paul remained steadfast in his confidence in God. What a tremendous example. If we would be soul winners, friends, consistency of walk, of manner, of life, is the powerful foundation. If we are all over the place in our walk, and one week we're earnest and serious, and the next week uh, we are worldly and unpleasant no one's going to believe us when we bear witness to the Lord Jesus Christ but if we're like the apostle consistent in our godliness it's a powerful testimony we shall need to say very little because the Lord who gave us the grace to live a consistent life will make that a powerful testimony to those that know us the second thing about the apostle is that he was humble. Almost first up, you could say, of the traits that, uh, that uh, were referring to Paul here, look at verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. We shouldn't overlook the joining here of Serving the Lord and humility of mind. Paul could have been so overbearing, so overloof. He was an apostle. 
In fact, he was the most instrumental of apostles. He labored more abundantly than all the other apostles. And yet, despite his high office and great success under God as a preacher, he was a man of humble mind. He was humble before God. It's interesting that the way this word is one word in the original, but we have three. Humility of mind. Where does humility begin? It's not just a natural disposition. It's a way of thinking. If we think humbly, then our deportment, our, the way we relate to others, will be humble. If we are, our minds entertain proud thoughts, and we're rather pleased with who we are, and our attainments as a Christian, that will overflow in the way we interact with others. They'll soon pick it up. But Paul was a man who was of humble mind. He sensed that before God, who was he? He was once an injurious, damaging, persecuting individual. He had no claim upon God's grace. He had no right uh, to be delivered from uh, that wicked way of life as a proud Pharisee, destructive to the church. The Lord had redeemed him. He had made him a chosen vessel. How humbling that was to Paul. If we entertain such thoughts, it keeps us humble. Who makes me to differ? Why have I been called out of this world, delivered from all the stain of my sin and all the power of my old wicked heart? The Lord has delivered me. I haven't delivered myself, and I didn't deserve it. That promotes humility when we think such thoughts, when we realize of all that we haven't done, that we ought to have done. Has the Lord gifted us? Has he given us opportunity? Has he blessed us with wealth, with a stable background? All these things are benefits. They are talents to be used for the Lord. If we reflect upon how we've come so short, what a poor reflection of Christ our lives are, that will serve to keep us humble. Paul served the Lord with humility of mind. He had a servant spirit. The word here is the slave word. He was bound to the Lord. His time wasn't his own. His decisions were not his own. First and foremost, he looked to his master in heaven. Where would you have me serve? How would you have me serve? He was subserving his own wishes to the wishes of his master. That helped humility. He wasn't a self-determining person. He had to look to the Lord to guide him. And every Christian should think like that. Lord, not my will, not my career ambitions, not my choices, first and foremost in life, but Lord, what is your will? How would thou have me live? That's the spirit of Paul here. He was not overbearing, willing to stoop to any service, willing to help and support and comfort all that he came into contact with. Thirdly, <coughs> Paul had a heartfelt, caring disposition. It says here, verse 19, serving the Lord with many tears. These were not tears, first and foremost, that he had referred to for personal hurt or for danger. They weren't the tears of pain at being lashed and then placed in the Philippian jail. These are the tears that he shed for souls who were going astray, for believers who had made a good start but then faltered and were spoiled by false teaching. These were the tears that he experienced 
And when he saw uh, the Jews, his own countrymen, opposing the very gospel of Christ, their promised Messiah, he felt these things deeply. He was a man who was moved. He wasn't just a professional speaker. Far from it. He was a soul winner. And he loved the souls of men. And he wept over those who he saw self-harming, as it were, and leading them uh, and uh, determined to go in a way that was foolish. He saw the power of Satan. He experienced Satan's hindering of the gospel. And it caused him to weep. Tears here is joined to temptations. Now, in the New Testament, the, this is the temptation word, but it doesn't always mean an inducement to sin. Sometimes it means more generally just a test or a trial. And Paul had many of those testing situations where he could so easily have given up and been discouraged. And this is the third of my character traits of Paul. Despite that, he was determined. There was a purpose, a resolute side to Paul's character. Just go back to verse 13. This verse teased me earlier in the week. Why is this verse in scripture? We went before to the ship and sailed to Assos, there intending to take in Paul because he had appointed, decided to go on foot. Now from Troas to Assos was roughly, if you look on a map, 15, 20 miles. He was going to walk that journey. Doubtless Luke and Others, Timotheus and so on, who were with him, said, Paul, we're going by ship. Just put your feet up for a day whilst we travel around the coast to Assos. But Paul was determined that he would walk. It was said in one of the Greek writers that the road or the track from Assos to Troas or the other way around was enough to kill any man. It was obviously a rugged path. It was up and down under the Mediterranean sun. It would have been a, a, a challenging journey, but Paul took it. We're not told why. Was it, as Matthew Henry said, because on the way he wanted to visit certain believers? Or he wanted to bear witness to his saviour, to those in the rural areas? Or was it that he wanted time alone with the Lord? It could have been any of these things, but he was determined. And it gives us a little insight into the way Paul approached life. He didn't always choose the easy route. He was prepared to take the more rugged, challenging path if it gave him opportunities to further the cause of Christ and to prepare for future battles. For fifthly, Paul shows here that he had an ambitious, visionary spirit as well. I'm going back to chapter 19 briefly. Look at verses 19, sorry, 20 and 21. After these things were ended, Paul purposed in the spirit. Spirit with a small s. It was his inner resolve. He purposed when he had passed through Macedonia to go to Jerusalem, saying, after I have been there, I must also see Rome. He set his sights on Rome. He had a holy ambition to carry the gospel to the very, to the very seat of power in Rome. Now, this was not personal ambition. He didn't want to go to Rome to see the sights he wanted to go to Rome to establish the reign of Jesus Christ. Personal ambition is one thing. But do we have spiritual ambition to serve the Lord, to advance the cause of Christ, 
to the highest degree that, we, that is possible? Do we pray for opportunities? Do we seek that the Lord should use us in a mighty way? It's not wrong to do so. Paul says, if any man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. He then explains that it's not for every person to choose to be a bishop, but to aspire to it prayerfully and humbly, willing to be whatever the Lord in his providence appoints. These things are good. Then look at verse 20, sorry, chapter 20 and verse 16. Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus. He hasted, if it were possible for him to be at Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. Why? Was it because it was an old Jewish feast that he wanted to keep? Far from it. Paul knew that Jerusalem at that time would be filled with worshipping Jews, proselytes, men from all over the Roman world, who would congregate to keep that feast. What a gospel opportunity it would give him. And so he was determined to secure that opportunity. This is Paul's visionary character. It's something that we should imitate, friends. Sixthly, he was a man of sacrificial cake mindset. Our, our text here, I don't count my life dear. I don't put any value on my life, is what he means here, humanly speaking. Of course, he valued his soul. Of course, he anticipated the glory of heaven, of his homecoming to God. He had a desire to be with Christ, which is far better. But as far as the gospel went and his labors on earth, if he would go up to Jerusalem and there he would lose his liberty or even his life, he resigns himself to his sovereign God. It's not that he was reckless. Verse 3 in this chapter tells us he changed his plans when he knew that the Jews were lying in wait to kill him. He was prudent. He, he sought to preserve his life where he could but at the same time, he didn't place great store on his own life and liberty. We can apply that to ourselves. We may not be exposed to the danger of martyrdom, but the various elements of our life, the mindset of Paul here, ought to be our mindset, a sacrificial mindset. My health, my family, my reputation, my possessions, my earthly prospects, my bucket list of things I would dream of doing, all of those I don't count them to be of great significance. If it means I serve the Lord, but some of these things I have to forfeit, a name, an opportunity, then I'm willing, because my desire is above all to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Paul. And lastly, Paul was a man of diligence. He said here in verse 20, I kept back nothing that was profitable. I showed you, I taught you publicly from house to house what diligence there was in the apostle, in his ministry. So seven things that we ought to aspire to if we are believers, young people here. You've come to the Lord. He's blessed your soul. He's made you one of his. Then these are the traits. If God works them in us in our earliest years, then as we go on in life, they will become habits. They will, be, they will form our outlook on life, our approach. Now we must move on. Secondly, so we've looked at Paul's excellent manner of life. I want to consider secondly Paul's excellent ministry. He says here in this verse, 
and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus Christ to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So it was a ministry received from the Lord Jesus himself. It was a commission, a charge, a duty, a responsibility, a privilege. He describes it here as the gospel of the grace of God. And then a little later, a little earlier in verse 21, he summarized it as repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And they are the three ways I want us to think about Paul's ministry of the gospel. Firstly, it was the ministry of the gospel of the grace of God. What does that mean? Some of you younger ones here, perhaps you say, well, what is the grace of God? Why does Paul call it the grace of God? What a contrast that was to the pagan religion that pervaded the Roman Empire. What a contrast with the misunderstood religion of the Jews who thought that you had to keep rites and ceremonies and rituals and so long as you observed all your Jewish practices, God was well pleased with you. The pagans thought so long as they offered their, their vain sacrifices and observed their superstitions, the gods would be pleased with them. Paul comes along and preaches this radical message of the grace of the living God. The word grace, it means the free gift of God. We need to understand that. If we haven't understood that the message of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is a message of grace, we've misunderstood the gospel. There are millions of people in the world who see themselves as Christians, but they think that their Christianity and their acceptance with God is through the observance of certain rituals and rites and certain behavioral patterns. They may have their place, but salvation is by grace. It's a message which declares that Jesus Christ has done everything that is needed to bring us to God. What are our problems? Guilt? Can we remove that guilty load of our sin? Is there any works that we can do that in some way atone for that great penalty and debt before God? There are no works that we can do. There are no religious exercises that can satisfy the demands of God's just and perfect law. Only the sacrifice of Christ, his great work at Calvary, can pay the price of sin. Christ has done all that is necessary to settle our debts and to release us from our guilt. That's the gospel that Paul preached. It's a message of grace. Do we deserve the kindness of a saviour who laid down his life God commends his love to us in that whilst we were yet enemies, enemies in our hearts, hostile to God, God sent his son to die for us. That's the message of grace. A polluted heart, an old, cold, loveless heart. Is that our problem? The gospel of grace provides for it. Because the Lord Jesus Christ procured by his death and ascension the gift of the Holy Spirit that our hearts may be renewed. The children learned in Sunday school this morning that promise of God, I will put my spirit within you and I will put my laws in your hearts and cause you to walk in my ways. That's what the gospel promises. Is our issue, well, how can I come to God? How can I ask God to forgive me? How can, 
How can I presume that God can uh, accept me and make me his child? I feel so unworthy. I feel so wretched. I so easily fall into my old sinful ways. The gospel of grace provides. We don't have to make ourselves good and then ask God to forgive. We come as we are. So long as we are willing to be made good, so long as we desire that God should give us the strength to resist the old sins, we may come and say, Lord, take my worthless heart, make it wholly thine. So this is the first thing about Paul's ministry. It was excellent because it was a message of grace. And that's what you and I need. Grace to save Grace to forgive, grace to be made different, and then grace to live. The Lord promises he will be with us, and he will help us all through the journey of life. Paul's life was an expression, an advertisement of the grace of God. Why was Paul like he was? By the grace of God, I am what I am. Why was Paul consistent, humble, sincere, determined? It was the grace that helped him in all those tears and all those trials. That's the gospel that Paul preached. But then, secondly, he says that he testified to Jews and Greeks, this is verse 21, repentance toward God. Repentance toward God. What is repentance? Well, firstly, the key is here. It's to turn in sorrow to God. Not like King Ahab of old, you remember? Ahab had taken Naboth's vineyard to himself. He had cruelly allowed his wife to so manipulate the judicial system that Naboth was falsely accused and then stoned. And he took the garden. The prophet Elijah went to him and rebuked him. And he tread softly. And he showed a spirit of remorse. But it wasn't repentance toward God. It was toward self. He thought, if I don't change, I will suffer for it. There'll be consequences. I don't fancy the consequences, so I better say I'm sorry. That's not repentance. If the only reason we turn to God is because we fear the consequences of our sin, that falls short of genuine repentance. Genuine repentance involves love. It's been said that repentance and faith cannot be separated, and that's quite true. Because in order to genuinely repent, we must believe that God is good. We must believe that God is just and holy, but that he is merciful, that he is worthy of our all and worthy of our submission and our obedience. Is that how we see God? Have our thoughts about God been transformed? We used to see him as hard, demanding, unreasonable. But now, as we've learned of the Lord Jesus Christ, we see our God as being good. His laws are wise. His appointments just. And I gladly yield to him. That's repentance. We turn to him as to a creator, one who has provided for us, one who ultimately is the lawgiver. And we say, such a God is good. His laws are good, and yet I've ignored them. I've not loved him as I should. I've not yielded my life to him as I should. I've not kept his day as I should. I've lived for self, but I see that's wrong. I turn from those things. I see him as gracious. And that invites 
my sorrow on, all, on account of all that I have done to offend a God who is kind. We see him as judge, but also as a father. Now, when we have to, in some way, admit guilt before a judge, we fear the judge, but we have no other feelings for a judge. But repentance is when we see God not only as judge, but we see him as a loving father. When a, a child loves their father and they sense that their father is good and kind and benevolent, and then they see that they have been unreasonable, that child will cry. Not because they fear the father's punishment, but because they love the father's care. That's true, true repentance. Do you see God as being a God who is good, a fatherly God? And you say, Lord, I do not want to offend you anymore. I want to do those things that are right and pleasing. Repentance means to cease hostilities and to surrender. Repentance means to admit my guilt and to admit it with a degree of shame and sorrow and genuine confession. Repentance means to set myself against my old sins with hatred and with a desire that they should be overcome. Have you repented? That's the gospel. It's a gospel of grace that promises free salvation. But in order that God should so bless us with that free salvation, he calls us to repentance. He draws us to himself. He softens our heart. Has that happened? Can we say this morning, I have a heart that is now so different. I don't want to sin anymore. I want to please him and follow him in love and gratitude. That's repentance. Believer, we live like that. We're called to. It's not something that happened once when the Lord first converted us. We must live in a repentant frame. Grieving over sin, mourning over our failings, seeking grace to live in a way pleasing to our God. Lastly, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's so much that could be said here. But I want to join faith and repentance once again. We cannot believe without repentance. We cannot, I the Saviour, suffering at Calvary for our sin and say, but I'm going to continue in sin. If we believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is that one appointed by Almighty God and we believe that he came, that he lived as a man and that he laid down his life in love and in joy as a man to deliver us from our guilt and our sin, we cannot believe that without at the same time saying, I don't want to sin. I see what sin has done to my Savior. I see how sin, what it cost, how great a price was paid. I cannot sin with pleasure any longer. Oh Lord, keep me. Repentance and faith belong together. We believe in the person of Jesus Christ as righteous. Remember the dying thief at death's door, his energy sapping away. Exhaustion would finally overcome him and he would give out his last breath. But on the cross, he's saved. What? was the expression of his faith. He turns to his fellow prisoner and points to Christ and says, this man has done nothing amiss. He's righteous. That's why he can die for me. But he's without fault, without stain. 
To believe in the Lord Jesus Christ is to believe in the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to believe that he is the Son of God and therefore capable of a life without sin. It is to believe in his resurrection as one whose sacrifice was accepted by Almighty God. And therefore, if I trust in him, he will receive me and accept me. It is to have faith in the power of Christ to deal with my needs. Do you have such confidence, such trust? That's what's included here, faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I look away from all confidence in myself. I don't look to my parents, to my friends. They cannot save me. I don't look to some saint. I look only to the Son of God himself, the righteous one, who loved me and gave himself for me, and I entrust my soul to him. That's the faith that is spoken of here. It's the crux of Paul's excellent ministry. Well, we draw to a conclusion. There's so much here to encourage us. Seven characteristics of Paul's manner of life. An example to us all. Three aspects that Paul emphasized in his preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ. A gospel of grace that calls us to repentance and invites us to faith and trust in the only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. May the Lord move us to trust him and then to follow him, imitating those whom he has given as an example to us. Let's close our worship this morning with hymn 391.